Arizona Hispanic Connection. Hello, hello everyone. This is David Parra with AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Uh, ready for another radio program, a very, very uh, important one. Uh, and today we will be talking about lowriders, the Chicano movement. And um, a very, very critical part of the uh, Latino, Hispanic, Chicano history in the U.S. Lots of experiences, lots of struggles, lot, lots of successes, lots of victories, uh, lots of sufferings, lots of joy, lots of everything. And we're going to try to do our uh, best to uh, highlight some of the, uh, the struggles, some of the accomplishments. And... With us today is Joe Eddie Lopez, and before I forget, I'm sure you know La Doctora Elizabeth uh, Ortiz de Valdez. She said, give him a hug for me, so <laughs> I'll give you a hug later on. <laughs> Welcome, and Joe Eddie Lopez, and we also have Jose Cortez, uh, uh, a gentleman that I had the privilege of uh, knowing uh, for a few, several years now. And we also have David Garcia, and that would be you, David, yes. right? Now, you uh, are, uh, uh, you have a, uh, the president? Are you yes, the president of a car club? What is it, the, the, the name? The Sophisticated Few. The Sophisticated Few, and we also have Rick Dominguez, and you are from the Finiquera? Yes, I'm president of Finiquera Classics. Uh, president of the Finiquera Classics. And uh, we're going to do uh, our best to, um, to talk about the Chicano movement and do it and, and bring in the lowriders, uh, concepts, symbols, uh, meanings. Uh, we also cannot forget or detach the concept of pachucos and even cholos. Uh, I know cholos have more of a negative connotation, but I'm sure that after you, uh, you speak about this, how they connect, uh, pre people will have a more complete uh, version of, of where all this fits and uh, this, uh, this comes from. Um, so can we, um, can we start by just uh, having you, introduced, uh, uh, to, you know, introduce yourselves and just say a little bit about what the Chicano movement means to you personally, and then we'll carry out the conversation. Uh, can we go, uh, start with uh, Joe Eddie Lopez? Uh, yeah, thank you, David. I, uh, please, uh, I, everyone, if you don't mind speaking uh, uh, close to the mic, please. Thanks. I don't think that you can fully appreciate what uh, the Chicano movement uh, was and, and is unless you know the conditions on which it was started. In the early 60s, most, if you were Latino, a great number of those persons were farm workers. They worked out in the fields with very low wages, very long hours, no insurance, uh, subject to uh, insecticides that could do you damage. There was no uh, place for children. Uh, they had to be right with their parents. The situation was, was drastic for the farm workers. Fortunately, uh, as we know now, uh, Cesar started a farm worker organization and some of those things started. Uh, in Phoenix and in other urban areas, we finally began to recognize that there were also some problems in the urban areas. In the 60s, if you were a student entering kindergarten, only about four of every ten students completed high school. Sixty percent dropout of the students. That means that the opportunity to have professionals uh, as doctors, as engineers, as whatever, was sorely missing. Mm -hmm. And so that had to be addressed. If you lived in South Phoenix in the 60s, there were no hospitals south of the river. You had to come north in order to go uh, to some of the... North uh, of Van Buren. North, almost <laughs> north of Van Buren. And, and uh, to get medical, uh, medical care. We uh, had probably, and I could go on like this for about an hour. Let's, uh, mm. let's cut it a little bit short. 
the problem was that we hadn't very few, if any, persons that we could turn to in order to uh, try to remedy this these problems. We were politically powerless. Mm. In the legislature we had Lito Peña, but he was about the only one. In the city council in Phoenix we had one person, but for all practical purposes we were politically defenseless. We had mm. nobody to talk uh, on, our, on our behalf. That is one of the things that uh, gave rise to El Movimiento here in, uh, here in Phoenix. I've been credited with starting Chicanos por la Causa. The fact of the matter is that there were a number of individuals that uh, have and deserve that credit uh, as, much as, as much as I do. But um, I don't know uh, to what extent you want me uh, to continue. I, I think Maybe we for can... now, it's yeah. great. It's, it's amazing. You know, a lot of times when we uh, meet uh, veterans, we usually say thank you for your service. And the more I know about all the Latinos, uh, Chicanos who have fought for the privileges that I now enjoy, the more I feel saying the same thing. Thank you for your service because okay. it is just an, un I mean, it is so ungrateful for, for, it would be so ungrateful for many of us that did not have to fight the, that kind of a fight to be enjoying this, such a, uh, such privileges and benefits today and not know who the, the people who fought for those benefits are and be thankful to them and connected to them. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your service. Jose, uh, how do, what is uh, the Chicano movement means to you? I mean, I know you can take the whole hour too, but uh, try to just uh, give us a little, a little summary of the Chicano movement in your experience. Um, thank you, David. Um, like Joe Eddy, uh, you know, we have, uh, because we're younger, <laughs> we have so much history, and uh, we could go on and, and talk about this subject, uh, you know, for the whole hour and maybe more. But the Chicano movement, to me, is, is, is uh, a lot like Joe Eddy. Uh, I came to this country with my parents in 1950. We were brought uh, here without legal documentation so I guess you could say I was one of the uh, DACA students of the 50s right. and uh, we came here and uh, my parents without education without uh, uh, knowing the language struggled immensely I was able to witness how they were uh, humiliated I was able to witness how uh, we were discriminated not only by by the uh, by the mainstream population but by our own people mm. and as you're growing up and you're put through all these uh, uh, situations in life you at your young age you start to wonder what what did I do to deserve this? Right. And it starts to create a little fire in you. Mm. And as you grow older and you start acquiring that uh, educational knowledge, uh, you start to put two and two together and you come up with a conclusion that, all right, maybe I was a Mexicano at one time. Maybe I was a Mojalo at one time. But now I'm caught between two cultures. Mm -hmm. I'm... I, I, I embrace my Mexicano culture, but I also embrace, you know, the, the American culture where right, I'm at right, right now. But you want to make it better, not just for you mm -hmm. and for everybody else. And to me, that represents what the Chicano movement is all about. Now, Jose, I, I always wonder, I mean, marvel that, uh, and I just, uh, off the air, I, I asked Joe the same question. You did a crossover, right? Mm -hmm. You started in the fields, literally. Uh, it, was that in California? No, actually, it was in, in Colorado. 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 So Colorado. you started in the fields, and you ended up, uh, you know, be, from a campesino to an activist. That not all the campesinos have that experience. So to me, making that crossover, and from what I gather, it was educating yourself what made the, the what bridged the two together. Correct. It's a combination of education. And at the same time, going through these experiences in life that uh, 
you know, create that burning flame within mm -hmm. you to mm -hmm. make things right in society. And you keep going back to the uh, to the to the flame. So is yeah. that what what need what's needed? And do we need more of that flame today? I think the the flame is already there for some individuals because there are others. There are some of us who are more passionate, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't mean that others aren't. Right. But it's just that those that are more passionate. Uh, with a little bit of education and uh, the proper steering will right. end up into what is called uh, the, uh, the a fighter for social justice. So there are some uh, avenues to channel the activism. I mean, the one way would uh, be to just, you know, make a, uh, you know, initiate a fight or war or whatever. But I've noticed that that's not the route that the Chicano movement and neither of the Latino movements have taken is more uh, taking the avenue of advocacy of the laws of the political system to to bring in the change and that's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jose. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just reminded of Emma Torres from uh, San Luis, Yuma area. She, she also st you know, you know jo, you you're smiling, Joe. You probably know her. Uh, and uh, she also started in in the fields. I mean, she just posted a picture not so long ago, and she's now the CEO of Chicanos. Uh, I mean, Campesinos Sin Fronteras in Yuma. And I'm sure there's a, a lot of Emmas, a lot of Joes, a lot of uh, jo, jo, uh, Jose Cortez. Uh, it, it's just unbelievable. Uh, can we come uh, to David? You are uh, the president of a, a car uh, a, a car club. Can you tell us right. what is the experience of lowriders as a club in terms of the Chicano movement? Well, <clears throat> if you can get a little closer yeah. to the mic. Well, Thank um, you. you know, lowriding, uh, as far as the Chicano movement, you know, it's been around quite a bit. It's been around since the early 60s, probably even before then. Um, you know, as far as what we're what we're trying to do, as far as the movement is concerned, we're just trying to keep it alive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we you know we've been around. I've been around personally low riding since the early late seventies, and we're just trying to. Uh, just and what is the feeling of those in the sophisticated few club in the Finiquera? What is that feeling like of 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 being in that in that uh, activities of uh, of you know the clubs well, but, and yeah basically what it is it's, it's a pure family it's a pure it's family, a family orientated um you know organization we we, we pride ourselves in in keeping together reaching out to other people and um just trying just trying to do the right thing i mean there you know there's a there's a lot of clubs out here and what we're trying to do these days is trying to <clears throat> organize organize the clubs that we can um, get together and uh, put the uh, positive movement out there these days. Perfect. Uh, Rick, can you uh, uh, share also the, your experience uh, in, low ride, in the lowrider movement and, and, and how that links to the Chicano movement? Well, uh, first of all, my name is Rick Dominguez from Finiquetta Classics uh, Car Club. And uh, just like David was saying, you know, we, we come together to try to keep things moving, the movement, the Chicano movement, um, doing things to keep keep people knowing that we're still here we're still out here uh, very prideful in our vehicles and what we do um it's um it's it, it's linked together i know jose said it many times and i always think of him when he says when i tell people is that you know the low rider goes along with everything else that we do especially when we get together in groups uh they have mariachi they have the food they have everything but i always think the low rider always fits into our culture into mm -hmm. into what we do Right, and uh, that's to me that's that's what it's all about to keep it going. Is this? Uh, are there a lot of many clubs in Phoenix, in the Phoenix there's area? There's very many clubs. There's right. a lot of clubs, and as time goes, there's a lot of youngsters starting new clubs, and uh, you know some some of the some of the things that the older guys do is kind of missed now, but. That's something that we're working on as we get together as groups is try to you know give them some education, let them know you know a little history about of you know course. where we come, where we're going. Thank you so much. We're going to go on our first break, uh, and we'll come back to uh, to ex to develop this concept about the pachucos, the lowriders, and the cholos. You're listening to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. We'll be right back.
Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. And the subject today is Arizona Hispanics, Low Riders, the Chicano Movement. Uh, Jose would like to ask you to help us understand the meaning of the word Mexico, Mexicans, and then Chicanos. Uh, you know, Mexico and the United States have been married for a long time already, and they seem not to still <laughs> have to get along, have a good, a good rela- uh, you know, yeah. uh, It's almost like a marriage, yeah. right? And uh, would you mind, Jose, explaining the, for many of our listeners, uh, may, many probably are young, and I think it's worth uh, understanding the meaning of Mexican, Mexico, and Chicano. Sure. Uh, David, when I first came to this country, I was, in my mind, I was just a youngster, three years old, and, and I had been taught that I was a Mexicano. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was great. I, you know, I, that's all I knew. But when I started school three years later, and and uh, they called me Mexicano, they didn't call me Mexicano, they called me Mexican, mm. dirty greaser, and things like that. And and I started to really uh, become offended with that word, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to be a Mexicano anymore. Wow. So I wanted to be uh, what others call Spanish. Okay. Because Spanish was uh, is more European and and that was accepted. It mm. it didn't sound as as bad as Mexican, dirty right. Mexican, right. and that's what the little kids would call me. So you It's, grew up thinking that being Mexican was the greatest thing. On no, earth. and no. all of a sudden you hear that and it almost uh, you and, want to disown that. So so. <laughs> And then, especially when they would sing this song to me, I'll, I'll never forget it. Jose, can you see? Oh, man, that, that, was, that was the worst thing for me. Anyway, to make a long story short, because I know we've got a lot of information. Uh, Chicano, uh, I started, as I started to understand what it is to be part of this culture in the United States, uh, you know, cars, uh, pizza, hot dogs, I realized that even though I embraced the the the, the Mexicano culture, I wanted to be part of this. Mm. But even though I wanted to be part of this, I wasn't totally accepted. So knowledge and education is what what freed me. Mm. I learned how other individuals were fighting for social justice and cultural identity, like Cesar Chavez. Corky Gonzalez. No, so, uh, Cesar Chavez was a Pachuco, I understand, right? He was he was part of the Pachuco movement. For he, he, when he came back from the war, the, there are pictures of Cesar that you can see him in his zoot suit. So the the word Chicano, Mexicano. So the the word Chicano, I think a lot of the youngsters who found themselves in the situation that I found myself in wanted an identity, but we didn't want to be. Mexicano anymore because mm. in reality we have been here for so long that we weren't. So th- the word uh, Mexicano comes from the word Mexica, which is which is the tribe, uh, the indigenous tribe that that uh, that inhabited Mexico. So from that, from Mexicano came Chicano. Mm. So as a as a result of that. Uh, You know, most of the youngsters that were here during the 60s wanted, uh, who uh, wanted to create an identity for themselves and, and be recognized. So, so it's basically the, the same root, but in, in time it picks up a different nuance with Chicano, where, where now you're dealing with these two cultures and you're trying to kind of stay away from the, the derogative uh, term yeah. Mexican. Yeah, and, and, and again, it, it's all just ignorance because uh, ignorance and the fact that, that you're subjected to constant uh, uh, ridicule mm. because of who you are. Right, right. Mm. Can, can we elaborate, uh, um, you know, the concepts of uh, the pachucos and then the suit suitors and the cholos? Where is that in the Chicano movement, Anjo? David, I uh, must admit that I am uh, lacking in the history of those both of those movements. I can't talk uh, to the issue of being Chicano. Uh, the dominant society here uh, in the United States looks down on people that are different from them. And clearly there's no way of hiding 
our our identity. We have language, we have food, we have different music, and those kinds of things. Uh, in uh, many instances, the skin color is different too. That is correct. Yeah. And in in most instances, a lot of the people uh, think that that is a secondhand uh, uh, makes you a secondhand person. So Chicano is just any person of uh, Mexican descent that has recognized in himself a value as a person. And until you can do that, you cannot begin to address other issues. Uh, it is it is a great thing that our our great leaders like Cesar Chavez and and uh, Corky Gonzalez, uh, a lot of the people in California and in in Texas, uh, recognized this early and they talked primarily about being yourself, being proud of what you do. Being a farm worker wasn't something to be ashamed of. You were putting food on the tables of all Americans, and you ought to be proud that you are serving a uh, decent uh, job. And it is through this recognition that we are persons, that we have value, that we were able to, uh, to change the, uh, the speaking uh, things of, of, of this society. Unfortunately, it still exists. I had a nephew in California that told me that he wanted to change his name from Lopez to Loper because in his school, that name Lopez identified him as something different from from them. I had to sit down with this young person and explain to him that his father was an engineer Mm. had a master's in mm. engineering, was in charge of a hundred persons, uh, tremendous uh, knowledge, and that he ought to value himself, love himself. And, and uh, finally he began to, uh, to understand. But that is a problem. Chicano uh, now is a person of any uh, race that recognizes that he is an individual, has uh, a pride in himself, values himself and uh, is contributing to society in that in that manner so can we say that that the pachuco the the suit suit it's it's more of a a, a symbol that the an attire uh that that this community especially the ones that were caught in two cultures mm -hmm. early on in their lives that identify uh, that, that identify them jose is that uh, yes, absolutely, uh, because it was the Chicanos of that of the 40s who uh, put on this flamboyant uh, outfit. And where to, does that come from, that, that, that outfit, uh, that You concept? know, during, during that time uh, is when uh, uh, Tintan, uh, who is a famous uh, Mexican movie star, was living in Juarez. And some of the producers uh, in that area wanted to make him uh, representative of that culture there in in, uh, in Juarez and uh, the El Paso area that uh, that was uh, you know and, and the type of uh, slang that was used, which was calo, mm -hmm. which which was not it's Spanish but with a lot of slang in it. So they they had him dress up with this uh, this type of uh, flamboyant suit, and as a result of that, many youngsters started adopting it, and it was it was uh, it was used for quite some time. But in the early fifties, it started to die down, and I and I was a witness to that because a lot of the uh, farm workers that were going migrating to Colorado from Texas. Would, would come, and these were the, the farm worker uh, pachucos. Mm -hmm. They weren't 
wearing the uh, the flamboyant suits anymore, but they were still wearing the the, the fedoras. They were still wearing the the the, the baggy pants, the the Stacy Adams, and that's where I got a taste of pachuquismo. And a lot of them would wear the, would put a little cross on their forehead as the symbol of the Pachuco movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was in the fifties. I was just a youngster. Then uh, in the 60s, when we started to, when we uh, migrated to Arizona, I realized that you weren't seeing too many of these. And when we got here uh, to, uh, uh, to Phoenix, I started to see a different style. It was more of the, uh, the, uh, the khakis, uh, the, 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 the Pendleton, uh, the T-shirt, and, and 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 as and slowly but surely the the pachuco movement started to die out not only he, uh in 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 Texas but here in in Arizona and uh, so California. it started to die out more in the style but not in la causa not, not in, 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 not, in, not in, in they were both representative of, of the same thing it meant that you were an individual who were proud of who you were, uh, that you embraced your your your, your Mexicano uh, culture, but at the same time, this is where you were, and, and this is where you were going to stay. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, those statements made by by the the, the pachucos and and the uh, the cholos is through their tattoos. And can you explain just a little bit where the violence comes? Because a lot of times when people talk about cholos. The, I think the, the word violence kind of pops up. Is, is, do you know where that came from? Is that just like competition with barrios? Or, or, or? Yeah, well, you have to remember that most of these individuals that were started the, uh, the, uh, these movements came from you know, disadvantaged areas where there wasn't a whole lot of money. And uh, you, know, you uh, pretty much were the caretaker of your neighborhood. Mm. And then when somebody came to your neighborhood and started, uh, uh, you know, doing things that were inappropriate, your job was to protect it. Mm. So as a result of that, uh, violence was, was one of the ways to resolve it because of the fact that there wasn't, uh, uh, you know, the, the education necessary. Uh, and I think a lot of that uh, was, was uh, you know, a, a lot of that was was uh, helped when Cesar started the, his movement because a lot of these uh, individuals that were cholos, that were pachucos, uh, transitioned from that into the the farm worker movement. I know that I was one of them. I went in there very loud and proud and fiery and wanted to solve things my way, but Cesar had his way. He says, mm-hmm. "No, this is how we do things. We 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 don't condone that. We're nonviolent." So, so you had conversations like so that with him. I, I I had to uh, I had to adapt to a, a lifestyle, and I think that we need to pick up that concept when we come back. We yeah. need to go on a break. Uh, you're listening to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. We will be right back. Welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection, and we will continue with our conversation, Lowriders, the Chicano Movement. And Joe... Uh, in the last segment, we 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 ended by uh, saying that that anger, uh, that sense of uh, of, uh, of wanting to do something, needs to be channeled through the proper venues. Because if not, it's just it's, it becomes violence. Uh, and I think Cesar Chavez was key on that in the way he operated. He he understood that. Can you elaborate on that? Surely, um, what separates one leader from just the regular person is his vision of society. Cesar Chavez, uh, there is no doubt, was a great uh, organizer, was a great representative of farm workers. But he was a lot more than that. Cesar did not make a trip anywhere and make a speech uh, without mentioning the fact that Latinos had to get an education. 
he knew that a large portion of the farm worker uh, labors was going to be done with by mechanization. Mm. And he thought that there would be no place for all these people that are now uh, that were now in farm workers uh, to uh, to get a, a job. So he understood that uh, that he had that we had to get an education. The other thing that he thought about was that it was good to have boycotts. It was good to organize uh, farm workers. But without a political base, mm. having somebody in institutions of government speaking on behalf of Latinos, that their job was, his job was going to be a lot harder. So he came and uh, recognized and encouraged mm. young people to get involved in politics, to vote. And he did a, a, a very good job. Almost any politician, young Chicano that you meet today, will tell you that in some way, Cesar Chavez contributed to his getting, uh, getting involved. Mm -hmm. I did not want to go into politics, but he talked me into it. Mm. I, uh, I went because he uh, thought that being a farm worker was a, a, a senator, uh, being in a position, a top position, and talking about these issues was going to make his job uh, a lot easier. So you went to become a senator and a representative of the state of Arizona, correct? That is correct. And you're saying that, that he encouraged you to do that? He encouraged most or education. most politicians to, to education. that I know of mm. got their encouragement from wow. uh, from Cesar Chavez. So the, this is he, an aspect that a lot of times is not highlighted, you know, because you talk about the huelgas and the boycotts, but so that he was that kind of person with that kind of a vision. That that is correct. Mm. Uh, there is nobody greater as an example. Uh, but uh, you talk about Corky Corky Gonzalez from Colorado. Uh, same thing about him. Uh, he stressed more the education aspect, but uh, and and in Texas we had leaders that talked about getting involved in in politics. You had others that were involved in organizations such as uh, LULAC mm. and uh, and and other organizations. Very uh, now, I I kind of in in my preparation for this program, I kind of sense that. In the past, we used to have more individual leaders, and that kind of evolved into the organizations that we now have among us. Is that accurate? Uh, I, I don't think that it is completely accurate. We have a lot of organizations now, but these organizations thrive because within those organizations, you, have, uh, you have some great leaders. Right. Chicanos por la Causa, for example, uh, again, I was given credit for it. But the fact that it has stood for this long and grown as much as it has and done as good as it has is because we have uh, have had tremendous young people there that have given— Can you mention some, some names? I think just to mention the names is a way to honor them. Well, uh, Ronnie Lopez was the first—was uh, the second uh, executive director. He moved us from a farm worker— to an urban uh, focus, mm -hmm. uh, but but there's a tremendous uh, amount of people that uh, that were involved, and I could mention all of them. Uh, we won't uh, at this at right. this show. I do want to say that uh, Cesar recognized the power of talking to other groups. In 1977 or 78, I was sitting in the office of Bill Soltero. Bill Soltero was a labor leader. Era compadre de Cesar Chavez. Mm. I was sitting with Bill. Uh, he had made me uh, one of his business agents. And Cesar Chavez called him. And uh, I heard part of the conversation, but after a while... Uh, Bill Soltero shoved the phone at me, and it was Cesar Chavez. And he had a young person that had volunteered uh, with his organization. 
but was now in the um, in the uh, car club mm. business. He, he wrote a magazine, and he wanted to come into Arizona and wanted to have a big show and a big uh, drive. We call them marches, but it, with cars, I don't know what <laughs> what the name of it is. But uh, he wanted to have that, and he needed to get permission from the police department. And so he asked if I could facilitate that. And uh, I did. I talked to the chief of uh, the highway patrol, chief of the uh, Phoenix uh, Police Department. And through him, we got permission. The The drive or the march of the cars wasn't all that big, but we did have a big show. And uh, I, I can't remember when uh, the car clubs have not been an integral part of that movement uh, so he recognized that talking to everybody no matter what their orientation or what their interests were they could assist in the farm worker movement as well this, this is amazing uh, honestly <clears throat> this is an uh, element of cesar uh, side of cesar that i had not heard cesar chavez and that's amazing to know uh coming to the you mentioned that the uh, car uh, shows movement has always been linked And I assume that especially in the beginning, I came to this country when I was a, kid, uh, you know, a young man, and I remember going on cruisings on Whittier Boulevard in East Los Angeles. I did not have a car, of course, <laughs> but I had some friends uh, who had nice cars, loud music, and you know, you would just go and do your cruising, and police was there all the time to you know, kind of not allow you to do your thing. What have been some of the struggles for you as a, as a car club to, uh, to keep this going? Uh, any, any challenges? As far as as far as uh, low riding is concerned, I mean, you know, we we were out there in the you know in the late seventies, early eighties, uh, low riding on Central, and um, you know we were doing we were doing what we loved. You know, the, one of the things that I like to mention is that you know the low riders is basically art. What mm. we're doing out there is just showing what we be able what we're able to create. Mm -hmm. um, so what we love to do that. So we're showing what we you know what we uh, put together. Um, you know, again, we did that every Friday, Saturday, and whatnot on, on Central Avenue. Um, we did get some pushback here in the uh, mid '80s, um, as far as you know, the cruising was concerned. And I'm pretty sure Rick can uh, agree with me on that. That pretty much in late late '80s, '90s, the low riding movement was pretty much pushed out of Central. Mm. And right now, I mean, right now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring that back. We're, and I believe we are succeeding in that. So especially early uh, early on, I, I, I kind of sensed that that was super, super critical to, because it was very much linked to the movement. Maybe today is not as linked, but it's still as important to, to the yes, clubs. Yes, of course it is, yeah. Uh, Want to add anything, uh, David or Rick? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, um, it brings... Um, It brings our people together. Mm -hmm. It um, it keeps us connected to each other um, in in different ways that you don't even think about. You know the art, like David was just saying. You know, um, the music, the food. It, it's just, Can you name some of the songs that that are part of this kind of movement? Because I know Jose asked me if we played music during this show, and I said no. <laughs> But do you recall some of the songs that are? Very popular. Well, you know, I, I know Tierra. I mean, Tierra. Right, right. Uh, there's Tierra. Together, there's, more. there's there's other groups out there that that really brought all that together. In the, Now, in Little the Joe 80s. and La Familia Joe from was Texas. The Texas movement. He yes, he also but, was right. a yes, big, he's a big, big, yeah, big on that. And right. um, you know, there's a lot of those groups were a big part of of what we do now. Mm -hmm. And um, I know. Uh, I know Jose it plays, you know, does his thing. He's La Voz de Aslan, you know, as he, as everybody knows. But uh, and what does, does that mean, thing. La Voz de Aslan? Is that a club too? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not a club, uh, David. Uh, Or it's it, a it's, concept. It's a concept. Basically, when I came, uh, uh, when I started radio <clears throat> back in 1980, I wanted to be a voice for the people. Mm. Uh, so Aslan is uh, at one time is is one of the legendary. Uh, cities of the Aztecas uh, and the Mexi were the Mexicas. Right. So, uh, so when I when I came on the air, I wanted to be representative of that voice. So I call myself La Voz de Aslan. Now to close, we need to go to on break. Jose, can, can you tell us for those people that see car shows and they, they has no meaning to them, how are they supposed to interpret those? You know, the Chican the the, the Sutsus, the Pachucos, the cars. How is that supposed to? How, how are people supposed to interpret that 
if, if they are from the Latino, Mexican American community, Chicanos? Each car club, each car is, is, has its own uh, individual identity, mm. which becomes part of, of a community identity. Uh, and to, to express that identity, you'll see cars with murals of La Virgen de Guadalupe. You'll see them with, with uh, Aztec designs. Uh, you'll see them with religious signs. You'll see them uh, with uh, signs of promoting nonviolence. All kinds of different murals. So it's, it's a walking library, I mean a rolling library of, of our com representative of our community. It's definitely part of the culture. It's culture. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. We need to go on our last break uh, and uh, we'll be back in just a few seconds. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is our last segment. This is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. And, you know, in uh, our last segment, I, I, I just feel that, again, in, in preparing for these kinds of programs, it forces you to do some reading and, and thinking and talking to people. And uh, I kind of see that, uh, you know, from the time Hernán Cortés uh, set foot in, in Mexico, that pretty much started a, a whole new, a whole new history. And, and it's been like over 500 years And I think the struggle has never ended. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of progress, but it's still there. And uh, I, I kind of sense that, that the, the lucha, the struggle, the efforts of advo uh, advocating uh, activism is just one movement that uh, at a certain time in history, it may take a different kind of look, a different perspective, even a different name as what the uh, Chicano movement uh, picked up that uh, strong identity, strong concept, but uh, in a kind of a objective uh, fashion, we can identify that it's been the same lucha that has been, has been going on for a long, long, long time. And I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that have improved. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I, uh, one of my biggest motivation to serve my community is the understanding that I need, I am thankful. I am thankful to Jose Cortez, to all of you, to Jot, who have, uh, f uh, you know, fought. You fought. I came, you know, uh, almost at the end of the fight. And the fight is different, of course. It's very different, the fight today. But, but I just feel a sense of gratitude to all the people. The more I learn about history, the more I understand what has happened the more I, that sense of thank you for your service, not just to veterans, but to all the, the Chicanos and the Mexican-Americans, the Latinos, the Hispanics, however, uh, uh, you know, we decide to, to call, or somebody else might decide to call us. It's just a sense of gratitude. And, and Joe, uh, I think it's, 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 there's just been one movement in a sense, correct? Dave, the struggle continues, and uh, it, it'll continue, I think, forever. When we first started Chicanos por la Causa in 1967, one of the big problems that we had was the word Chicano. Mm. A lot of people in our society did not accept that word. They thought of it as uh, degrading oneself. And so it took quite a while uh, for there to be an acceptance of the word Chicano. Today, uh, very few people have any problem with the word Chicano. They may not consider themselves Chicano, but they know that uh, they what it references. Now, was uh, that a little better than La Raza? It is the same. In the way that it was uh, accepted or not accepted. Uh, a lot of the people that didn't like Chicanos probably didn't like to be La considered Raza. La Raza either. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it finally gained, uh, gained acceptance. And it comes through education. It comes through being self-awareness. In 1957, when I went to Arizona State, I started there. 
you could go all day without seeing another Mexicano. Mm. Uh, there were some, mm. but very, very few. Uh, you could, most of the doctors that we had in Phoenix were from Mexico. They had settled in Arizona. Uh, attorneys, engineers, uh, surgeons, and all of these things were probably non-existent. Today, we graduate from Arizona State University itself, a tremendous amount of lawyers, engineers, doctors, mm. and that have served us uh, very well. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, the, the struggle c continues in different areas. Uh, immigration did not, uh, for a long time, uh, was, was an issue. Primarily because uh, our dominant society needed our labor force, and so they didn't say anything about it. Today we have some racist uh, politicians that don't want anything to do with us, so immigration has become a great uh, focal point in uh, our struggle so we've we've given uh, our attention to that, and hopefully in in a few years that'll be resolved. But different problems are going to arise, and the task that we have is to be able to change so that we can address whatever problem comes up. and i'm and I'm confident that we will primarily because we have so many more educated young people. So today. education and identifying the political system as the two main areas to generate change in these days is a huge thing that is very prevalent in our community, it's the, the Hispanic community, I mean. That is, that is correct. And, and, and leaders, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Uh, Cesar Chavez, Corque Gonzalez, uh, they all had their primary interest uh, and attention that they gave, but education they saw as the force that was going to change the uh, status of the Latino in, uh, in our country. You know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be having a show on civic engagement. Uh, and uh, again, to identify education, and to identify the political system as the avenues to move on. Uh, I mean, my father was uh, a bracero. My dad, Jose Te Parra Medina, he was a bracero. And that's how eventually I came to this country. And, and now I'm doing this radio show for ARP. And now my children have an education. So, uh, uh, and I mean university or education. And, and so, So that kind of just shows, and I'm only one of thousands of thousands of examples. So we've, got, we've left the fields, and we've come to, or at least there's a path, you know. And, and it's just unbelievable, Jose. Uh, we're coming to a close. This is an amazing journey. Uh, uh, you know, the, the lucha, the efforts uh, that, that, that lasted centuries and will continue, as uh, Joey says. It's, a, it's been a rough one. But I think we can already enjoy the fruits, and we already, just like uh, like in my uh, little research that I did, there came a point where to be Chicano was something to be celebrated. Brown is beautiful, just like the black community at one point said, "Black is beautiful." So, so there's been a lot of, but it has taken that flame, Jose. Mm -hmm. Let us go back to that flame mm -hmm. and channeling that flame in the right way. Exactly. Cesar always stressed education, and I, I stress that immensely as well, simply because it was through Cesar's um, involvement back in the, um, the 70s uh, when he was here that he, uh, he made it possible for me to get a grant through a, a, a program for, for Chicanos, it was called for campesinos, for farm workers. It was called the Migrant Opportunity Programs. And that's how I was, I was able to get a grant to go to broadcasting school and continue uh, you know, in, in my career of broadcasting. So I credit him for that and, and uh, I push that immensely. Uh, I know that in, uh, now in working with, with the car clubs, That is a struggle in itself because we are struggling 
Uh, and I don't want to take the you know the thunder away from them. I'll let them talk about it. Rick and uh, David. Well, we do um, we do a lot of events, but uh, there's some particular events in, that we have coming up, like Dia La Raza that we have coming up. Uh, we do at the end of the year and um, <clears throat> other events. Um, Dia Los Muertos we also do, and um, you know these events are good events to stress the you know school and going keeping our kids going to college and stuff and this is what we actually some of the tools that we use to keep to keep in touch with our kids and keep it, them going you know when think when people think about mariachi they link it to the culture like cultura yes. uh, our culture it's car do you do you see the car shows it, as just another item of Mexi- of the culture yes i do it's it's big it's 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 what's become um it's it's what's become what we know now. People know, you know, they put it all together. Right. It, the lowriders, the the old cars, they, they come together right along with everything else. You know, um, I have so, a different fr- perspective now of car shows too. So I, I will be joining some of them in, in you know those shows. Yeah, most most definitely. You're you're welcome to anything that that's out there. You know, again, the lowrider movement. You know, we um you know we've had our challenges, and I believe now we've um, we've we've had a lot of hurdles, and we've we've we're able to jump over them and keep going. Um, yeah. You know the 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 crowd out there is a beautiful crowd out there right now. They they uh, they accept everybody. Um, there's you know there's not a uh, a negative out there right now with the lowrider community, and that's a good thing. Um, so you know we just want to keep it going forward. Perfect. Not to cut you guys off, but uh, we also do parades and we um, you know get the veterans involved. We, wow. we take the, the, the veterans in the parades and mm-hmm. stuff like uh, you know at the end of the of the year for the Veterans Day parade. We also get we will do in our that, best so. uh, in our platform to uh, promote your events yeah. through our page. Great. Anybody who's listening, you can join our page AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection, and I mean uh, Facebook page. Great. Yeah. Great. Final thoughts, Joe, uh, regarding our conversation today. Well, I would uh, simply recommend to your hearing audience that uh, uh, we are uh, Latinos. Uh, A lot of us want to call ourselves Chicanos. Uh, but those uh, with that cultural identity have uh, continuing problems. And I would hope uh, that they would at least in some form, uh, recognize that and give uh, assistance to uh, any organization that is trying to promote uh, Latinos, their own culture. Car clubs, uh, I have completely different uh, kind of uh, feelings about them. I used to think that they were a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, hoodlums um, driving these cars uh, but uh, but I've recognized uh, uh, what they have done and and uh, that that is only one section there are many many other people that contribute multifaceted right. final words because they were almost out of time I'll make it very brief uh, the fight continues Joe Eddie and uh, the groups that he belonged to have fought for many, many years. Thank you to each one of our guests. We ran out of time. We promised to do more shows on this subject. Thank you very much. This was AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Have a good day. Arizona Hispanic Connection 